Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'm always really excited to talk about this stuff. It occupies most of my waking life. Um, sort of doing it in Hastings, sharing it with other neighbourhoods, helping people in other places uh, to take up these kind of challenges and also trying to write up a thesis after six years of uh, fitting a PhD research around this kind of activism. Um, I'm going to share a screen uh, and I'm going to um, talk about DIY really. DIY experimental emergent approaches to transform reality uh, is a nice phrase that Gala used. Um, and this is the kind of just do it version of, of activism. Uh, I haven't ever been tempted to try and get into local government, um, but, I'm, but I just want to kind of get on with it on the ground. Um, and it's this kind of work that I've been doing, first of all, in Deptford in South East London, where I was for 12 years, and then in Hastings um, since 2006. And that I've also been so delighted whenever I find it elsewhere. And of course, you find it in Liverpool in spades. So it's been great to, uh, I'm really pleased to, to be here. Um, my company is called Jericho Road Solutions. And that comes from this quote from Martin Luther King, which is, you know, about uh, the Jericho Road is where the story of the Good Samaritan happened. It's really important to, uh, to help people and to kind of pick up the pieces but he said, one day we must come to see the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that people don't get constantly beaten and robbed. And I take that to mean we have to transform our neighbourhoods, the physical places, in order for social change to happen. And I really believe in, in kind of neighbourhood as a, as a site of social justice, that very fine grain scale that's very knowable, very human, and where one change can kind of cascade into another really quickly, like fire spreading. Um, the, so this is about making small scale alternatives in the cracks. And the first thing I would say is that we shouldn't be apologizing for that small scale, that our job is to kind of break the mold, the dominant models around property ownership and individualism and then to celebrate that and to join up between us. And that just doing it doesn't mean not thinking about it. We're thinking about it all the time. And that neighborhood scale doesn't mean parochial, or at least not in a, a negative sense. I've always been really impressed by how the community sector seems to me to be kind of bifocal. On the one hand, it's completely focused on that fine grain, on that local level, but also looking around, uh, up and around in solidarity together. Um, so I'm going to tell you what we've been up to in Hastings. So the really quick version of this story is that in 2006, our pier was closed for safety reasons. It was community action that saved it. It took a very long time. Um, but we now have the best conditioned pier in Britain. But that action about that pier was always focused on the place, the neighbourhood. Sorry, not, uh, not the pier itself as a piece of Victorian folly, but as the neighborhood, as what it was meaning for the neighborhood. And that focus on the wider neighborhood continued and grew, um, having succeeded with uh, saving the pier. We started to, to look around at the neighborhood and there was some really fairly crazy dereliction. This is right in the center of Hastings town. Um, and it was always kind of treated, what Douglas Adams in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy talks about as someone else's problem. It was always seen in that way, just as the pier had been seen by the council and others as somebody else's problem. But having experienced the rescuing of the pier, we kind of knew that this stuff wasn't someone else's problem. It was ours to solve. So in 2014, we bought that building. See that, that one to the left with the to let sign on it? That's, that was called at the time Rothermere House, and it was the remains of, um, alongside it, the, the print factory from the Hastings Observer newspaper. This was the kind of offices for the newspaper. And it had closed in 1985, 
and been abandoned and certainly the, the main big building there had been um, derelict for 35 years. So we tried to buy the big beautiful building, that didn't work out, we lost out at auction. We ended up buying this one in the centre of the picture, the, um, the 1969 office block. So it's nine storeys and over the next five years we took a, what we now call an organic phased development approach. Um, organic because we didn't know what the phases were when we began. We certainly didn't have a phased plan. We just we bought it for £235,000. We had £80,000 left in, in the bank and we had a report that said it was going to cost £1.9 million to renovate. So we had 80 grand, we didn't have 1.9 million. So we threw the, the quantity surveyors report away <laughs> and got on with it. So we started off with just doing a couple of floors and bringing some tenants in uh, and then moved on over time. And this now has six capped rent flats and 42 capped rent workspaces and a community kitchen. Um, a couple of years, well, during that process in 2016, we decided that we wanted to expand and kind of spread the impact and embed the impact locally. So we set up the Heart of Hastings Community Land Trust and took on some more buildings. Um, that's just a, an image of a, just how derelict these spaces really are. Um, so here we are in 2021, we've been buying up that dereliction. And at the same time, so all of those um, coloured in or greyed out spaces are all now in community ownership. Um, and, and as you can see, they're all very, very close together and they're clustered around the old alley, which was in some of those pictures, which itself is um, not owned by anyone and not adopted by any authority. So it's a kind of urban commons. Uh, and at the same time as these purchases, we were developing what does, what's the we? You know, who is we? And it is actually not a single organisation, it's an ecosystem of connected organisations that all share values and a kind of vision. Um, so there's these early investors that came together to create a social enterprise developer. There's a, a housing management company, Living Rents, which is owned by that developer. The Heart of Hastings is part, uh, part owns the developer. We've got a builder that we work with. We've got a charity called Leisure and Learning, which kind of animates the spaces and so on. So this ecosystem has been really important in, in giving us kind of speed and scale and also resilience. So we've been able to do, I think, a great deal more than any single organisation would have been able to do. And part of that is because they're all different from each other. So although they share a really strong vision and values, they're all different types of organisations and they have different kinds of appetite for risk, they can access different kinds of money and so on. So it, it's really proved, and particularly through COVID, really proved to be a very resilient approach to this. So this is kind of where we're up to in terms of progress. Uh, and actually we've just taken on a development lease of, of a building just down the road. So this is very much emergent. I have to continually update this um, this map. Um, so just to come back to the Observer building, you can see what it looked like just a few years ago uh, uh, in the top right there. And then this is an image of what how we hope it, it will um, be renovated. It's been derelict, as I said, for 35 years. There have been 13 owners during that time before us, and every one of those except one made money on this building without doing a single repair. So they bought the building cheap, they got planning permission, they flogged it on for more, more money. And it's really, it's a kind of embodiment of what's wrong with our land and building system, with our property system. The, the idea that 4,000 square metres of building bang in a town centre can make money for people without them ever actually fixing it. It seemed to me, to, to all of us, to be so horrendous. And it was, it's really been that outrage that has driven us to, to keep going on this. So on Valentine's Day 2019, we finally took ownership of that, that monster <laughs> um, and uh, 
stopped that process, hopefully forever. So it's kind of, what, what do we do? Why do we do this? And what are we going to do with it all? We see ourselves as being about unlocking barriers, cutting the wire, making it possible to do things differently. And most of all, the, the, the analogy we use all the time is about darning the fabric of our neighbourhoods. So taking a totally different approach to regeneration that is very fine grain, very careful and very much involving people in that darning the fabric physically, socially, culturally and economically. So making spaces that people can make into homes and focusing on life changing opportunities for people who usually miss out and place shaping opportunities again for people who normally don't have those opportunities and all of it based on 15 years of sustained community engagement um, Hannah earlier in a in the session earlier was talking about uh, less formal consultation and more soaking up what people think what people care about because you're there to soak it up and that's certainly what we've been doing um, we do mixed use all, all, almost all our buildings are mixed use wherever possible they are because because neighborhoods are mixed use you know um, lives are mixed use we we don't have homes and other types of spaces com completely separate from each other they're all integrated and I know that uh, Britt was telling me that Home Baked is focusing on live, work and play. And we certainly, um, those things are really important. We talk about spaces for living, for working, for leisure, for learning and for community action. That we're trying to create the spaces for all of those um, activities. But today I'm supposed to be focusing on homes. Um, so the idea of homes I think as a very special kind of asset within the overall um, neighbourhood and uh, I've put a couple of quotes up there but you know I think we all know really this point about the, the dilemma at the heart of the housing struggle is this conflict between use value and exchange value and that you know the conflict between housing as, as a kind of lived social space and housing as an instrument for profit making. Um, Madden and Marcuse wrote this brilliant book called In Defence of Housing in, in 2016 and they make this point that housing has a special capacity to spur the political imagination by revealing existing power relationships and allowing for the imagination of alternative social orders. So I think I didn't, didn't come into this world from, from housing, I came into it from neighbourhoods. But I think that they're absolutely true that homes are a, a very special kind of asset and that we need to try and make these spaces, these actual real flats and, and homes and take action to decommodify them, to take them out of that market where the uh, pe profiteers can make money without um, prioritizing the users of those spaces the the home where the people who live in those homes um, so here's a few of our tenants uh, and the Liverpudlians will potentially recognize a visitor in there who's not from Hastings so that's uh, Hazel Tilly from Granby Community Land Trust Granby Four Street um, came on a visit and she's there in the flat with Adam Clements who's uh, one of our tenants in Rock House and Adam talks really beautifully about, he, he talks about my home in the commons. And he says his home is different from anywhere he's lived before because it's secure, embedded, he belongs there. And he, this is a direct quote, I can be myself, mess up and still come back. I'm still here. This is my home. Everyone around me is also trying to survive. We're doing it together, but in comfort and security not in squalor and fear. And that's the same for these other tenants, Bob and Sharon, Sarah and Will, Amanda, and all of our tenants. You know, life doesn't suddenly get easy just because you've got somewhere safe to live, but it does become survivable when you've got somewhere safe and you've got other people around you. And I think the home in the commons 
is something really important for us to, to think about, that it's not just homes, that a home in the commons is both shelter and connections. It's the home that we have to ourselves, but it's also the home and the spaces that we share together. You know, in Granby, Cairn Street is the commons. Uh, for us, the alley is the core of, our, of what we now call the Hastings Commons. And, you know, this work is uh, it's happening not just in Hastings and Liverpool, but all over the place. Um, it's a, it was a pleasure for me recently to meet someone called uh, Dr. Susan Actimel in Glasgow. She set up the Ethical Lettings Agency, Homes for Good, and she's actually actively looking to support um, others elsewhere to set up these kind of ethical lettings agencies. Uh, there are a lot of people all over the country doing really exciting work and, and what's so great about our world is that we tend to be sharers, um, so we tend to want to talk about it and to share the lessons from it. Uh, so both Susan Actimel and us have a particular kind of selection criteria for tenants, of course, and this is both for residential tenants and for the, the work tenants, the commercial tenants. Um, they, need to, they need to need it, so they need to be in housing need or, or have a need for, for affordable um, workspace, uh, a local connection, an enthusiasm for the ethos and a willingness to contribute to the commons. We're always looking for relationship builders and we're always trying to set kind of new social norms where cooperation becomes normal, where it's normal to look after each other and to look after the commons together. Uh, so that that kind of cooperation and commoning is rewarded with really high quality places to live and work. And it's because it's rewarded, more people will want to, to be like that. They'll, they'll want to, to they'll be incentivized to um, share in that kind of ethos. So just, if homes in, are a special asset, they also, at a very special kind of risk. Um, we're doing all this work to make the neighbourhood better, but who's it for? You know, there's a lot of evidence that neighbourhood improvement leads fairly quickly to, to gentrification. Uh, so my view is that self-renovating neighbourhoods of whatever kind need to take really deliberate action to prevent displacement. And we, we were thinking about this back in 2015 because the rents in Hastings has always been a very affordable place to live, both to buy housing and to, and to rent, um, but it was changing. We could see already rents starting to, to rise. Part of the reason Hastings has been so affordable is because it's been kind of stigmatised. So it's, it's a poor place, but it's also a very stigmatised place. It's the kind of place that people who don't know it, certainly... Um, um, across the southeast, think of it as a dump, basically, and that had helped to protect us. You know, there's a. a I, I said earlier, I um, the first half of my life was in Deptford, which is where Millwall Football Club it was based. And Millwall have this um, this kind of attitude: no one likes us, we don't care, and that <laughs> that's a really helpful kind of attitude. And Deptford was a bit like that. It was a bit like that's fi it's fine that no developers want to come here. It's fine that you don't want to buy houses here. Unfortunately for Deptford, that has massively changed in the last 20 years, um, and there is huge development pressure. Deptford has been de-stigmatised and is now yeah, facing this terrible, or has been facing this terrible pressure. And so the same kind of thing was happening in Hastings. We were starting to get called the new Hoxton, and this sort of thing, the idea that this was going to be a really hip and trendy place. And it is a really creative and quirky and interesting place, but that started to, in itself to get commodified and sold um, by estate agents. And so we were getting really worried about this and we were thinking, what can we do? And the only thing we could think to do was to try to buy property, bring it into community ownership and cap the rents forever. So we set the rents back in 2015 at one third of local median income which is really low because one of the things Hastings faces still now is it has really low wages. Um, in fact, there was at one point we, it was the lowest in the country apart from Hull. So that gives you a sense that, you know, this is not the affluent southeast despite being 
bang on the south coast. This is a little piece of Sunderland in the in the southeast. Um, so really low wages. So we needed to cap them so that nobody should spend more than a third of their wages on or their income on um, on housing on homes. Um, and really, that was really important as well. That this whole concept of affordability, you know, is something affordable because because it's 80% of the market. No, you know, the market is broken. It's a totally bust system. So we don't want to uh, hitch affordability to the market. Neither do we want to hitch affordability to local housing allowance rates, which are set by politicians. So what we want to hitch affordability to is how much money people have. You know, that's what makes something affordable, is if you've got enough money to be able to pay for it and still be able to pay for the other things that you need. Um, so we set the rents at a third of local median income, we call them living rents, and they're capped forever. So they rise each year with inflation, but they will never rise um, beyond that. So in the meantime, Hastings is changing around us um, and prices and rents are rising. Um, so in November 2019, we held a meeting to talk about how Hastings was changing. We expected maybe 50 people to turn up and we had all these tables laid out and all this plan of how it was going to work and 150 people turned up. So it was a bit chaotic, but I love this picture. It looks like some kind of old master painting. Um, so lots of people turned up and we began to develop a whole set of possible solutions, uh, both the long term, more community led housing and the shorter term. So that's where Acorn Housing was was born from that um, Acorn Hastings, sorry, was born at that that night. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, a slide showing this is just within the White Rock area, which is the little area that we work within. And, um, and you can see that they're, they're rising fast and that since the pandemic, three quarters of a million people have left London since the pandemic. London is hollowing out and uh, it feels like sometimes they've all arrived in Hastings um, and they're all buying houses because, of course, they're able to um, buy not just one house for themselves at vastly cheaper than their London properties, but also buy others that they can then rent out and they bring their expectations of rent levels um, rather than the ones that we're used to. Uh, so we feel that we need to keep buying, um, but so far this work has taken 68 separate funding awards, grants and loans of various kinds, and um, that's a massive distraction, it makes it really hard to plan, and it really limits the scale of what we can achieve. So what we've been working on recently is the idea of some kind of neighbourhood investment mechanism. We're calling it that to be as vague as possible, to try and explore what that might be that would enable this kind of action to be able to move fast and to bring more property into community ownership to do more of this kind of work. I'll stop sharing there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. So full of um, so full of, of images and um, and poetry, which is you know it's it's so good to um, hear it spoken in that way um, and see those images. So. Um, yeah, we have a very similar, I was just saying, you know, what you bring up, the question chimes really, really loudly at Homebaked and I'm sure at many other places, that question of, um, of creating value and who do we create it for, you know, and do we, do, does that mean we, we, we stop creating value for ourselves, you know, because that creates value for others. Um, and might push us out. So this has been really valuable, I think, for us to hear. I wonder if we go into um, some very specific questions for um, Jess um, that have come up in the chat. And then I think, why not together take a tiny bit of time that we have to um, attack that question, you know, what can we do? 
and what else can we do? So Jess offered, and what else can we do? But let's start first with some um, sort of um, hands-on do questions. And there was one from um, Catherine, uh, how do you support tenants beyond providing the secure space? Yeah, that, that is really important. So um, with Living Rents, the company, the housing management company, is certainly not just about collecting the rents it's about supporting people um, so pastoral support for, and it's not it's interesting actually that Susan Actimel the, the person I mentioned that does Homes for Good she has a whole tenant support kind of team that's led by a qualified psychologist we don't have that <laughs> we just have um, we just have some some kind of uh, staff who've actually come about most of them have started off as tenants and then have moved into staff roles and so it's they're not trained but they have a really strong ethos which is that we pay attention to people we know that people's lives go up and down as soon as somebody seems to be struggling with any with rent or, or with any other payments then we'll go and sit with them talk it through with them see what it is that's that's causing that problem and actually we've been really i don't know if it's lucky or, or it comes out of this anyway that we we um have not really had much tenancy arrears people the only time we do is when people are really having problems and then we try and help mostly people prioritize paying the rent because they know that their rent helps to keep everybody else's rent going you know and they know there isn't some great profit in the whole thing so yeah we we support we support people informally um but also people support each other that's the that's the biggest thing really is that the, the both there's a sort of the residential tenants support each other but also the residential and commercial tenants are, are totally intermingled and you know we spent there's a lot of a lot of uh, encounters happen all the time in normal life again uh, obviously the covid has been really in fact the covid's been a really strange experience for us because of these mixed use properties we, in some points we closed the building but you can't close it completely people live there so we had to make sure we were keeping it clean and safe for the people who lived there and the commercial tenants have been brilliant because even though they couldn't go to work there when in the main lockdowns they carried on paying their rent because they knew we had to keep the building open for the residents so there's a, there's a lot of uh, and one another example is um there was a flood one time and and the the water coming through the wall into this into this flat it was really really scary within 10 minutes there were like 30 people from around the building all helping to get bob's um, furniture out and say you know look after him and that night they put up a little crowdfunder type thing to to raise some money for his uh, to get him some new furniture and it, people were contributing to that because they knew somebody in the building even though they didn't know him so they would say, oh, um, if you're a friend of Erica's, you need, you know, I'm willing to put in a tenner kind of thing. So people were putting in money through solidarity. And I think it's that kind of support is just as important as Susan Actimel's qualified psychologist. There is a question from Gala about will this living rent you were talking about have a combination with basic, in with basic income? Or you're working towards that, I guess, is the question. Um, Nala, do you want to maybe um, specify what you mean by basic income? I, I don't know how it's called in English, but this idea of becoming a, yeah, an income, universal income, just for the for the reason that you exist. I don't know, I, I don't know how it's called in English. I'm sure there is a concept that, I, <laughs> that I'm missing. Um, but when you say uh, living uh, rent, I thought oh, this would be a great combination, not this basic income, universal for all of us, just by the way that we exist with this idea of a uh, rental level. And I'm, I'm, I was just wondering if you thought about it, like how to combine rental level with a basic income. I call it basic income. I will check in the dictionary now how it's called in English. Well, there is an idea uh, and a lot of interest in the idea of universal basic income uh, in Britain, but of course we don't have it. So, um, so I suppose um, 
What's so powerful about, powerful about this work is that once you have bought these buildings, you can use the power of the freeholder for good. You know, at the moment, freeholders generally use their power to exclude people, to set the highest possible price and so on. But you can use that power in the opposite way. So you can use it to cap the rents. You can use it to be inclusive and to be welcoming and so on. So living rents is something we can do. The universal basic income is something we have to lobby for and fight for, but, but we, can't, we can't kind of do it now ourselves. I should say, I wanted to answer some, uh, Joe wrote me a personal message which I totally wanted to raise, which is that many people bought and lost community shares in Hastings Pier, and that's absolutely true. So I obviously did a very brief version of the story, which didn't include the fact that in the end, the charity that was running Hastings Pier went into administration, and certainly people lost their shares. Um, that hasn't actually affected uh, Hastings Community Land Trust, which does have community shares. Um, and it also has a thing called the Investors Collective, which is for people who have a bit more money. The shares are just £25, but for those people, a lot of them moved from London who have spare cash. Uh, there's a scheme where you can invest between £5,000 and £50,000. 10% of that is shares, and the rest of it is a loan. 90, so the biggest part of it is a, a three-year loan, and they get some interest on the loan. But when the loan is repaid after three years, they're still shareholders. And we've actually found that people um, people still willing to do that and wanting to, to put into that, both at the higher level and the £25 level. Because when people lost their shares in Hastings Pier, it wasn't about the money. Nobody, nobody, I, would, I think almost nobody cared about the money. It was about the loss of the asset from community ownership people were absolutely furious about. Um, and I have been involved in a, a thing since then called the Protecting Community Assets Inquiry, which has come up with a set of recommendations about how we might actually protect the assets once they're in community hands for the long term, or at least protect the interest, the community interest in that. There was also a question that I don't quite understand that came from Neil. And there might be a about the NIM. Yeah. Yeah. So the NIM is the neighbourhood investment mechanism. Um, uh, what would you see as needed to have the very important NIM up and running? Well, I've done a, I've done loads of research onto this, but in a very broad sense, looking at. One of the things I'm really interested in is can we steal ideas that the private sector use to raise money and adapt them for the social sector? So I've been looking into things like real estate investment trusts and venture capitalist capital trusts and all there's lots of different things that they use. It's really quite difficult because a lot of those things only work at scale. So for example, a real estate investment trust, which could be a really good thing for us to adapt. And in fact, there is a New York real estate investment cooperative, uh, which is an adaptation of real estate investment trust. But you have to be listed on a stock exchange and that costs £175,000 every year to be listed on the stock exchange. <laughs> so it's only possible if you're large. So there are some things we could do in Hastings, but mostly we would like to see other people in different parts of the country doing these kind of local NIMS, whatever they end up being called, and then coming together, because together we could be large enough to justify um, the scale that it would take to, to list on the stock, stock exchange. And of course, once you list on the stock exchange, you have access to a vast amount of money that is looking for returns, including some money that is focused on what they call ESG, environmental, social and governance, so the kind of ethical investment side um, and until you can list in that way on, on some kind of stock exchange you're never going to have access to that scale or, or breadth of investor. All right. I wonder if there are some other specific questions or comments from from 
такой. Oh, your views on ethics. Go on then. Uh, yeah, we. Ethics has been um, really good for. I think Brighton and Hove Community Land Trust have recently done a, a um, share offer on ethics. We've we've looked at it several times. Um, we're we keep sort of switching between. Are we trying to raise money for one building, one specific uh, building, or are we trying to raise money for a vision of the neighbourhood, a big a bigger vision? And so. We do a prospectus for one building, but it takes us so long to do that that, that by the time we're ready to put it out there on FX, um, we've kind of moved on. You know, I, I think the problem with the money in this field in general is that you can't get the you can't get funding, whether it's grant or loan, until you can point at the specific building that you want to buy. And by the time they've got gone churning through their great long processes, that building's gone. So you need a war chest of some kind, and that's what this um, investors collective has is been. It's the money that we can move fast with uh, to put down a deposit to to move towards a purchase. Um, so, yeah, I, th I mean, I think FX is is uh, is worth it if, but you you know you have to have your prospectus. That's the point. You have to get get organised and do that, and it still takes time. How supportive is the planning department? Not. <laughs> I, was so, I was so cross about that, about safe and the bootle thing. It just infuriates me. So with the observer building, I mentioned earlier that a lot of the owners have made money out of getting planning permission. It has so many totally unsuitable planning permissions, unbuildable planning permissions that they were never going to build. They got the permission and they were just using it to make money. We come along. We decommodify it. We've got fa fabulous vision for it. It's all really eco brilliant. It's all wonderful. And they are so infuriating. We have something like 26 planning conditions that all have to be signed off before we can even start. And it, it's, yeah, it's driving me mad at the moment. And the alley where, you know, that dereliction of that alley, it's been, it used to be known as Rape Alley. It's really, really shockingly bad space and we are transforming it. And right now, I've got a planning application in to try and do some bits and pieces of transformation there, which is being publicly funded, and the planning department are going, oh, it's a conservation area. You can't possibly do th this, that, and the other. It's like, you've ignored it for 30 years. You've totally ignored it. Now we're trying to do good things, and you're get making it really hard. So, yeah, no, it's not. I'm very cross with them at the moment. <laughs> There is one last question from Bryn, and then I'm going to ask Gala to, to come back in for our final conversation that we can have together. Uh, yeah, how do, tenants, how do tenants find out about upcoming rentals? So we, we have a big waiting list of interested people, which we always go to first, partly because every time we um, do advertise a property, we end up with huge numbers of people that we would love to house in there. Uh, you know who are perfect for it but we can obviously only give it to one household so um we we list on our own through our own networks but we also work with the local authorities both the the housing team at the the district council and also the supported accommodation team at the county council because some of our tenants um have come through supported accommodation where they've got to the point where they're ready to leave supported accommodation but they can't because they'll get dumped in some horrible one-bed flat. They'll be vulnerable to exploitation. They'll be vulnerable to losing their tenancy and ending up going back into the system. So they don't actually need, you know, full-on su statutory supported accommodation, but they need a supportive environment. And and we've found that um, that that's worked really well. People have have really been able to to become properly independent um, through joining the commons, as it were. And it's such a different experience to do to join something like that, a supportive community, than it is just to end up in some horrible, which there are lots of horrible one-bed flat, isolated and and uh, yeah, alone. <laughs>